today are jumping back in our series, Led by Fire, Following the Life of Moses. And today, if you've got your Bible or you've got your phone, the Bible on your phone, go to Exodus chapter 15. I love this series and I love what God is teaching us through it. And today, we are coming to a passage of scripture that I think is going to surprise us. We're coming to what is known as either the Song of the Sea or the Song of Moses. Now, what you might not know about this song is that this is the first song that's recorded in the pages of scripture. And not only that, one scholar says it's presumably the oldest song in the history of the world. You're gonna read the oldest song in the history of the world. That's what we're gonna look at today. On top of that, it's the most important song in redemptive history, which means it's the most important song in history. Because this song shapes all of Israel's future worship and ours. You may not even know it, but this song has instrumentally shaped your worship. It shaped what we did this morning. It's shaping what we're doing this morning. So we're gonna look at this song and you know as I was prepping for this you know you're starting to think about songs and I'm kind of a, a sucker for when you're you know you're browsing the internet and you get on a page and it says top 25 songs in the history of the world these are the top like rankings doesn't the, the web loves rankings like these are the best movies of all time who decided that some guy in his pajamas is like, oh, let me see. You know, he's making a list in his mom's basement. Um, you know, you know, like who's picking these? Who's ranking these? But we love them. I, it doesn't matter how many of those I click on. I'll click on another one. I'll just do it. Um, so I was, I was not, you know, you're like, well, you were supposed to be studying. Uh-huh. Um, so I was thinking about songs and I came across this article where they asked a group of neurologists and neuroscientists to scientifically determine what is the best song that has ever been made. So a group of neuroscientists said, okay, we're gonna get together and we're gonna do this. And some of them were from King's College in London. And one of the guys, his name is uh, Daniel Glazer. And he said, and he's trying to make, feel like, make us feel good about this process. He said, we can measure how people respond to a song in a bunch of ways, including brain scans, actually measuring foot tapping, or smiling muscles, there you go, smiling muscles. And they determined, so this is gonna be surprising for some of you, that the very best song that has ever been made is the 1982 hit, Africa, by Toto. Some of you, some of you are like, I have no idea what that is. Cue track. <laughs> oh, I bless the rains down in Africa. There you go. You're welcome. That's the very best song in the whole world. Exodus 15 begs to differ, folks. Moses was way in front of Toto on this one. Um, and so with that, go to Exodus chapter 15. But what that makes me think of is the fact that if we went around all the campuses, if we surveyed every person in service this morning online at all four campuses, you know what? We get thousands of different opinions about what the best song is. Thousands. Because we got a lot of opinions. We got a lot of personal preferences. And I think what can happen is that the way that we view something like music or what is the best song, that kind of framework can then determine how we approach worship. So that we can, if we're not careful, tend to think that worship is about the individual. That worship is, is something that is personal and so that worship at its best is when it's truest to who I am. It's truest to the style of music that I like. It's, it's truest to the atmosphere that I like. It's, it's truest to the, you know, the, the volume that I like. It's, it's worship is at its best when it's truest to who I am. 
But Exodus chapter 15, what we're going to discover as we look at these opening 21 verses is that worship is at its best when it's truest to who God is and what God desires. That's when worship is at its best, when it's truest to who God is, what is his character, what is his nature, what is he like? That's when worship is at its best. And I want to start in this song by just looking at these opening verses where Moses writes this because he's going to frame for us, he's going to give us some perspective in the prologue as to where he's going in the verses that follow. Exodus chapter 15, verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God and I will exalt him. You know, this isn't, part of the reason this song is significant is this isn't the only place this song shows up in scripture. What's so interesting is that this is a song of heaven, what we're gonna look at today. If you go to Revelation chapter 15, John writes this, I saw what appeared to be a sea of glass mingled with fire and also those who had conquered the beast and its image and the number of its name. So these are the, the people who've come out of the tribulation standing beside the sea of glass with harps of God in their hands and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, great and amazing are your deeds. O oh Lord God, the Almighty, just and true are your ways, O oh King of the nations. This is a song of heaven. It's not just what they sang on the other side of the Red Sea. It's what people are going to sing in eternity. And so this song is very significant. I, I think, though, before we jump into the song, it, looking at it in Revelation chapter 15 kind of begs the question, why does the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb get intermingled? Because if you were thinking about what they were going to sing in heaven, I wouldn't think the song of Moses. I would think the song of the Lamb, that being Jesus. I would think they would sing about Jesus, Jesus' life and Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. I would think they would sing about that. But the Bible tells us they sing the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb. And I think it's so interesting, uh, theologian and pastor Vodi Bakum says the reason that these two songs get in their mingled is that just as in the Exodus, everything, everything also in the cross and in the Exodus and the cross, everything begins and ends with God and his salvation. And the same things that are true of why the cross is central to Christian worship is the reason why the Exodus was central to Israel's worship prior to the cross. How so? Well, just as the cross for us shapes how we view God, the exodus for those prior to the cross shaped how they viewed God. And just as the cross shapes how we view ourselves, so for those prior to the exodus or prior to the cross, the exodus shaped how they viewed themselves. And just as the cross shapes how we view salvation for those prior to the cross, the exodus shaped the way that they saw their salvation. They saw God's redemption. It shaped it. And just as for us, it is Jesus' life, death, and resurrection that is the wellspring of our worship. So for the children of Israel, the exodus became the wellspring of all of their worship prior to the cross. 
the, the reason they sing the song of, the, of Moses and the song of the Lamb together is they actually were created to evoke and produce the same response. They shape our worship. And so as we go to Exodus chapter 15, we're gonna discover a number of things about them, but this song shows up, this, this song is so formative, it shows up again and again and again in the Old Testament. So portions of this song, you can find them in Deuteronomy 32, Jeremiah chapter 10, Psalm 86, Psalm 98, Psalm 111. And the Red Sea event is again and again a feature of Israel's worship. So when you go to Psalm 78, the psalmist says, he divided the sea and let them pass through it and made the waters stand like a heap. The psalmist writes in Psalm 106, he rebuked the Red Sea and it became dry. He led them through the deep as through the desert. So he saved them from the hand of the foe and redeemed them from the power of the enemy. And then one more. Psalm 136, to him who divided the Red Sea in two, for his steadfast love endures forever, made Israel pass through the midst of it, for his steadfast love endures forever, but overthrew Pharaoh and his hosts in the Red Sea, for his steadfast love endures forever. This song is knit into the fabric of Israel's worship. And the reason that it's knit into the fabric of Israel's worship is because it tells us what worship really is. The song's divided in three stanzas, and each stanza gives us insight into the nature of what worship is, what honors God, how has, what has God created worship to do, and how does it do that? Where does it have to start to produce that? And the first reality about worship that we see is that worship is centered on who God is. Go back to Exodus 15 verse 1. Then Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord saying, I will sing to the Lord for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. This is my God. It's about him. This is my God and I will praise him, my father's God and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war, the Lord is his name. The song starts with who God is. But before we unpack this first stanza, I think it's interesting to note what it tells us about Israel's worship. It tells us that Israel's worship was immediate. How do we know that? Well, we know it from the grammar of the passage because in verse one, the entire passage starts with the word then. In other words, after the Red Sea had collapsed on top of the Egyptian army, then. Then, immediately following, this is not a day later, this is not a week later, this is not weeks later, this is not a month later, this is not a year later. This is as bodies are washing up of Egyptian soldiers on the shore as there's debris floating in the water. Moses corrals the people and says, we're going to worship. We're not going to wait to celebrate what God has done in this moment. We're going to worship because he recognizes that worship is an opportunity. Worship is an opportunity, which means like any opportunity, we can miss the moment. Some of us are so concerned about what's going on in our world or what's going on with our schedule, that we're looking for a later moment to worship. And one of the instructive features of this song is that Israel didn't wait to worship when they saw God move. They responded immediately and spontaneously to what God did, as he brought them out of the Red Sea, as he delivered them from their enemy, boom, they used it as a moment to return praise to him. So if we 
miss a moment, what does that tell us about ourselves? And I think missing moments to worship or letting moments pass that merit praise does betray something about ourselves. James chapter one, if you go to the New Testament, James chapter one says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow to change. So where does any good thing in your life, where does it come from? Little quiz. Oh, you can do better than that. West Campus, tell me you shouted. Online, you're like breaking it down in your living room. Every good and perfect gift comes from where? Oh, come on, do better. God, some of you are like, Father, God, which one should I say? It's, 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 you can do either one, it's okay. Uh, it comes from the Father, it comes from God. And so if it comes from God, who deserves the praise for the moment? God, who, and I would even say this, if nothing happens on accident, if he holds the world in the palm of his hand, if he holds every moment, if he knows all the hairs on your head, if he knows everything that's held within every day that you will live on this planet, then every moment, since he's the creator of every good thing, every moment that produces something good, he created to return to him in worship. He set it up for you to do the most significant thing you or I can do on this planet. The, the Westminster Catechism, get this, it says, it, it asks a question, it's a question response, and the question is, why was man created? And the response is this, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. You were created and I was created for primarily one chief end, and that is to return praise and worship to God. That's why he created you. That's why he put breath in your lungs. It is the best, greatest, highest calling that any person could ever step into to worship the creator, to return praise to God. When you're doing it, you're doing what God created you to do. James says every good and perfect gift comes from him, so every moment is an opportunity to celebrate his goodness at work in your life. This, this song starts in stanza one with who God is, and I think, you know, Moses worships God that because he's strong and because he's mighty and because he's glorious and because of his relationship to his people. All of that's true, but perhaps the most surprising thing that Moses worships God for shows up in verse three. Look at this. O Lord, or the Lord, is a man of war. The Lord is his name. In other words, where Moses, kind of the nucleus of Moses praising God for who he is, is that God is a warrior. Can I just stop right there and say, when was the last time you worshiped God because he is a warrior? Like you're just like, I'm just gonna stop and have a praise break and worship God because he's a warrior. When was the last time that happened? It's central to the way that Moses is instructing the Israelites to see God. And one of you is going to go, well, that's the problem then, isn't it? Because this is all Old Testament. We know that God was a warrior in the Old Testament, but we also know that the God on the left side of the book is a lot meaner than the God on the right side of the book. <laughs> Some people think that. God is a warrior. God is not, God is not mean. God is just. God is just. And that same justice and that same warrior quality to God's nature and character shows up in both Old and New Testament. Jesus is constantly doing battle with darkness throughout the Gospels. And then when you get to Revelation, oh boy, when you get to Revelation chapter 19, look at this. Then I saw heaven open and behold a white horse and the one sitting on it is called faithful and true and in righteousness he judges and makes war. This is Jesus. His eyes are like a flame of fire and on his head are many diadems and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood and the name by which he is called is the word of God. 
and the armies of heaven arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword which with to strike down the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That's our God. Our God is a warrior. And here's the thing. Until you start seeing God as a warrior and worshiping God as a warrior, you will inevitably fight your own battles. You will inevitably, because if you don't celebrate God as a warrior and you don't see him as a warrior, life has battles. Your days will have battles and you will be inclined and I will be inclined to fight those battles on our own. And guess what? God wants to fight for you. God is a warrior and he fights for his people. And if you will embrace the same truth that Moses calls the children of Israel to embrace and cover to cover, the Bible calls us to embrace, all of a sudden you will walk through life with a confidence where you know that you are not on your own. God is fighting for you. His might and his strength is right at your side. That's a different way to live. That's a different way to live. Moses says, worship starts with who God is, okay? That's stanza one. Stanza two, worship celebrates what God has done. Celebrates what God has done. Look at verse seven. The greatness of your majesty, in the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out fury. It consumes them like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters pile up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue. I will overtake. I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill in them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. What did God do? You blew with your wind, the sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness, awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders? They celebrate what God has done. Here's the thing. Worship is based on facts. It's based on what God has done. Often we, we approach worship based on our feelings. So if we feel, if we feel like, oh, this is my song, like this one, I always get goosebumps on this song. I could just love it. <laughs> or we come in and it's a, it's a new worship leader and we're like, oh, well, worship might not be very good today. That is not worship because it's based on your feeling. Feelings change. The facts about what God has done do not change. Do not change. And if we worship God based on our feelings, we can come into a setting like this or at the West Campus or at the North Campus or Joplin or online, and we could come into a setting where the whole thrust of the day and the moment is about God and what he's done. But we can get so sidetracked by our preferences or sidetracked by our feelings that we end up letting our feelings drive us and determine the level of our engagement in praise to the creator of the universe. Uh oh. Uh oh. Here's the thing worship is meant to engage your emotions. God created emotions, God has emotions. You're made in the image of God. 
But emotions don't determine our worship. Feelings don't drive our worship. What determines, what dictates, what directs our worship is what God has done. Has he saved you? What has God done? Has he provided for you? What has God done? Has he healed you? What has God done? Has he worked to a miracle in your emotions or in your mind or in your relationships? What what has God done? There's a place for saying, you know what? Emotions and my feelings are going to take a back seat to the fact that the God of the universe is involved in my story. And that's more true and more significant than what I'm feeling in this moment. God has worked. The God of heaven and earth reached into today, into my life, into my story, into my family to do what only he could do. And because of that, I will not be silent. I will not shrink back. I will bring a shout of praise. Come on right now in the house, across the campuses. Let's do it. Let's bring a shout of praise. Lord, we praise your name. We praise you. Amen. It's based on the fact that God has done specific things for his people. I love that the Israelites don't give in to vague generalities in worshiping God. They get specific. They get specific about what God has done. Don't turn your worship into lip service. Start recounting every day. Start recounting when you come into this room. What has God done for you in the last seven days? Get specific in God's presence and move the fact of what and the facts of what God has done to the forefront and watch what happens in your worship. Finally, in the final stanza of the song, he says, worship connects us to God's future for us. Look at this, Exodus 15. You stretched out your right hand, the earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. You have guided them in your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard, they have trembled. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia, the Philistines. Now the chiefs of Edom are dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Cana have melted away. Terror and dread have fallen upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Okay, let's stop right there. We already got our time marker. This is on the banks of the Red Sea. The waters are still foaming and sloshing. How do the Philistines know about this? How do the Moabites know about this? How do, how do the Canaanites know about this? How do they know? They don't. They don't know. Well, it says, it's, it says the inhabitants of Canaan melted away. Terror and dread fell upon them. Well, how, how can they say that? Here's the thing, they don't know the future, but they know their God. And they know the God who's guiding them into the future. They know the God who's leading them by fire. And here's the thing, your praise and your worship should always be prophetic. As you proclaim the victory of God, that's another reason we don't worship by our feelings. We worship by facts and by faith because we serve a God who doesn't just say, okay, have fun. We serve a God who goes right alongside us and moves in front of us and before us and paves the way. He paves the way into the future he has for you. And your worship should be filled with this prophetic language about what God is going to do, how he's going to help you. Tell your peoples, oh Lord, pass by. Tell your people, pass by whom you have purchased. You will bring them and plant them on your own mountain, the place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode, the sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. In other words, God, you're going to bring us home. Oh God, we know there are enemies in front of us. We know there are battles before us. We're not saying there aren't going to be battles. We're just saying that God is going to fight for us because God is a warrior and that's what he does. 
God, you're out there in front of us. Praise you, because you're out there in front of us. God, I don't know what, I don't know what my boss is gonna say tomorrow, but I know you're right there. Lord God, I don't know what this, where this, this, this season of our marriage is gonna end, but I, I, I know you're right there. God, you're out there in front of me. I praise you. Because even when I don't know the future, I know the one who holds the future. The song connects them to their future. Their praise is prophetic because they know God is on their side. But in order to have God on your side in the future, you have to be on God's side in the present. In order to have that confidence that God is going to go before you, you've got to be going with him today. Where does the confidence come for Israel to sing the song about the future? Where does the confidence come for you? Okay, right where you're sitting, present day, October 1st, where does the confidence for you come that 2021 is gonna be a year filled with God's blessing and filled with God's goodness, and not just 2021, 2022, and 2023, and 2024. God's got good things. Where does that confidence come from? Where does that come from? Go back to Verse two, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. He has become, in other words, on one side of the Red Sea, he was not yet their salvation, but as they get to the other end of the Red Sea, now their foe, their, the, the enemy, has been vanquished fully and finally. As long as they were being chased, as long as there was a possibility of them being pulled back into slavery, they had not experienced his salvation fully and finally in their lives. But now they have. Now they can say definitively, you know what, we're not going back to Egypt. Egypt's gone. The sea, the sea separates us from our slavery. The sea is evidence of our salvation. In other words, there was a moment in the life of the Israelites where they went from slave to sons and daughters. They went from slaved to saved. It was done. From enslaved to saved by the mighty hand of God. Here's the thing I would just say to you. God has a future for you. Every single person in this place, God loves, God sees. Every single person at West Campus, God loves, God sees. Every single person at North Campus, God loves, God sees. Every single person on watching online, every single person in Joplin, God loves, God sees. And he wants to do good things in your life, but there's gotta come a moment where he becomes your salvation because that's where the rest of all that you see in these 21 verses becomes real in your life. There's some who've come in here across the campuses. You've come in today and truth be told, you're trying to do this for you. You're trying to fight your own battles. You're trying to be good enough for God. You're trying to, functionally, you're trying to save yourself. And someday you're hoping that when you stand before God, just like every person on this planet will, you're hoping that the good will have outweighed the bad and that you'll enter into eternity with him, that you'll get to spend eternity in heaven. Can I tell you something about that? The Bible says, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The Bible says we're not good people who save ourselves, that because of sin and the brokenness and the curse of sin, if, this, if the Bible was an old Western, we'd all be wearing the black hats, Jesus would only get to wear the white hat. We're not good people who save ourselves. We are lost people who need God to save us. The Bible says, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, the lamb, that whosoever would believe in him, any background, any story, 
any mistakes, any failures. Whosoever would believe in him would not perish, but would have everlasting life. He would become their salvation. That's what God wants to do today. If you've come into this place and he's not your salvation, that's why you're in this room. That's why you're at the Joplin campus. That's why you're watching online. That's why you're at the West Camp. That's, he wants to become your salvation. Hey everybody, thank you so much for joining James River Church on our YouTube channel. Our prayer is that you were encouraged and your faith was strengthened today. And we wanna let you know that we wanna connect with all our online family. You can just click the link next to me to connect to us. We'd love to meet you and connect with you. As well, we'd love if you subscribe to the channel and press the bell for notifications. I'll tell you what, it's a great thing to do because we're always putting out great sermons, new worship content, and that helps you stay up to date with everything that's happening. We hope you have a great day to day and we'd love for you to join us live for our services every Sunday and Wednesday. Thank you again for watching and God bless.